Well, folks, we're turning to Isaiah chapter 9 again this evening uh, to finish off our little series on the names of God. And we began looking at Messiah's names uh, just two weeks ago, the names of promise that we see in Isaiah 9 and particularly in verse 6. So we're just going to read the two verses that are so familiar to us, uh, Isaiah chapter 9 and verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen. We trust God will bless the public reading of his own inspired word. We've seen already two of the names given to this child that would be born, that son that would be given. And just before we continue with the remaining names, there's something else that I want us to see first of all. Uh, from verse 6. Look at the, at the beginning of the verse again. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Take those two phrases in particular. Unto us a child is born. Not just any child. We're looking back from our 21st century perspective. We can look back to Bethlehem and we can see that this child uh, was the Lord Jesus Christ, God in flesh. But in the 8th century looking forward, where Isaiah was, remember he was writing 700 years before Christ came, and looking forward to events that were yet to happen, this was another specific prophecy concerning Messiah. Messiah wouldn't just be someone who would grow into the role. Messiah wouldn't be just a regular person with a normal birth whose life experiences then shape him into becoming the Messiah. During the 400 silent years between the two testaments, there was a revolt against the Roman Empire and it was led by a man called Judas Maccabeus. In the Apocrypha, which is the section of the Roman Catholic Bible which we don't see as scripture, the Jews don't see it as scripture, but there's a number of books in there and four of those books are called 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th Maccabees and it's named after them and it's called the Maccabean Revolt. Well, Judas Maccabees, Judas Maccabeus was such a, a prominent figure, such a, a charismatic figure, that there were many of the Jews in the day thought that he was the Messiah. But they got it completely wrong, of course, because Messiah doesn't grow into the role. Messiah wasn't an ordinary person. This verse was telling us that Messiah would be a specific child born into that role. Unto us a child is born. He was born as Messiah. From the very beginning of his earthly life, he would be Messiah. The whole purpose of his existence would be his role as Messiah. But there's something else here as well. It says, unto us a son is given. Now believe it or not, those six words in our Bible are some of the most important words in Scripture regarding the virgin birth. Turn for a moment into Jeremiah, please. Jeremiah chapter 22. Jeremiah 22. After Josiah died, there were only four more kings. Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakin, with an N on the end, and Zedekiah. And here is something that was said about Jehoiakim. Now he's got a different name here. He's called Kaniah in verse 28. So look at verse 28. It says, Is this man Kaniah or Jehoiakim a despised broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not? O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. For no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David, 
and ruling anymore in Judah. Now why am I reading that? Well, there's, there, here's a curse from God on Solomon's royal line. And Kaniah or Jehoiakim was the last representative of that line. Zedekiah wasn't a member of that family. He was placed into the role of king by the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And Jeconiah, or, or sorry, Kaniah was cursed by God. God said, there will be no king will ever sit on the throne of David from the line of Jeconiah. I keep saying Jeconiah, that's a totally different king. From the line of Jehoiakim. So that causes a, a little bit of a problem for us. Because the royal line of succession from David was through Solomon. And now Solomon's line has been cursed. In 1 Kings 2.45, King Solomon shall be blessed and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. So how is this going to happen if the line of, of ancestry was cursed by God so that no king born into that line would ever sit on David's throne? How is this going to uh, be solved? Because this is later linked to the prophecies concerning Messiah. Back in Isaiah 9 and verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. This was written before the curse was passed. Did God suddenly change his mind? Well we go back to the character of God. God's unchanging. God doesn't change his mind. This was all part of God's plan. God has now cursed the line of succession. No one born into Solomon's line can become Messiah because Messiah would reign on David's throne. So how do we solve this? Now there are some Jews who suggest a very novel solution. Uh, that's usually a name that we describe something that's wacky and strange. But a very novel solution where they, it's a two Messiah solution. Where the first Messiah would come and he would die to atone for this curse that was brought on the line. And then later on a second Messiah would be born into this line. Who would then reign as king of, of the Jews. Now that doesn't solve the problem. Because the problem of a cursed generation can't be taken away by someone who's cursed. Someone who's under the curse can't take away the curse. But Isaiah 9 and 6 gives us the answer. Unto us a child is born. That's the humanity of Messiah. Born as a Jew, recognized by his mother's ancestry the same way that it is today. And described in Luke chapter 3. And there it's traced all the way back to Adam, showing his humanity. Joseph's father was called Jacob. Now I'm not talking about the Joseph in Genesis, I'm talking about Joseph the, the husband of Mary. His father was also called Jacob, but his father-in-law was called Heli. And we see that in Luke chapter 3. So the wording in Luke 3 is more flexible. It means that he was the son-in-law of Heli. And in order to die as a representative of all human beings, the Savior had to be fully human. And that's why Mary's ancestry is traced all the way back to the Garden of Eden, to prove that he was human. But the, sec uh, the second thing is that unto us a son is given. That's a Jewish idiom, a Jewish catchphrase, meaning adoption. A son is given. That's the adoption of Messiah by Joseph, who was of the line of Solomon. And he was bringing this child born out of Mary's womb into Solomon's royal line of succession. He wasn't born into that line. He was adopted into it. Now, had Jesus been conceived naturally, he would either have been born into the cursed line of succession or he would have been born out of the line of succession altogether. He could never be a king on David's throne. And this verse shows us the fulfillment of God's promise to legitimately overcome the royal curse by miraculously providing a Messiah born and adopted. And that fulfilled all the requirements of God's justice. That's why it's a serious thing to deny the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm sure you've heard of some clergy 
I wouldn't even call them ministers because they're not serving anybody except themselves or Satan. But some clergy who are going around scoffing at people who believe in the virgin birth. Without the virgin birth, there would be no Messiah to take David's throne. Without a Messiah, there's no saviour to redeem Israel. Without a saviour to redeem Israel, there's no saviour to redeem us, Gentiles. And without a saviour for either Jews or Gentiles, there's no salvation at all. And we're forever lost. That's how crucial the virgin birth is. If there's no virgin birth, we're lost. We're still in our sins. So that's the reason why we celebrate the coming of the saviour into the world in the way that he did through the miracle of the virgin birth. Now, last week we looked at the first two names, wonderful and counselor. We saw that wonderful means a miracle and that everything about the Lord is miraculous. It's worthy of wonder. And we should never lose that sense of awe when we think about the Lord. We also saw that counselor as well as meaning someone who gives advice and guidance, can also mean someone who makes plans and decisions. Now let me give you two verses that back this up. One from the Old Testament, the other from the New Testament. Psalm 20 and verse 4 says, Grant thee according to thine own heart, speaking to God, and fulfill all thy counsel. So God counsels himself, and, it, and he determines his plans and purposes. And then in Ephesians 1 and verse 11 it says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So we can always trust the Lord's counsel. He counsels himself. And whenever he gives us counsel, it's the same wisdom that he's using to counsel us as he does to counsel himself. So we can trust it. We can trust everything that God asks us to do. Now we come to the third name in this verse. And we see it here. It's the mighty God. The mighty God. Let's break that down for a second. Sometimes, this is a useful thing to do sometimes if you're trying to look at a name. Or if you're trying to dig into a passage. So any of you that are doing a bit of preaching and are going to get opportunities. And you will get more opportunities in the new year. Don't worry. Uh, to do a bit of preaching. Here's something that you can do. Whenever you see a phrase that naturally breaks up, emphasize each part of the phrase one at a time and see what it teaches you. So first of all, he is uniquely God. It says, the mighty God. Not a mighty God. The mighty God. He's unique. There is nobody else like him. Nobody even comes close to him. He is the mighty God. But then it says he is the mighty God. He is unsurpassably God. Nobody can overcome him. Nobody can uh, do better than him. Nobody can beat him. He is the mighty God. The powerful one. And then he is the mighty God. He is undeniably God. We cannot say that Jesus was not God. We cannot say that he was just a prophet or that he was just a teacher or that he was even a God. He is the God. He is undeniably God Almighty. The Jehovah's Witnesses, as they like to call themselves, if ever there was a cult that chose the wrong name for themselves, it has to be the JWs. Because the one God that they're not teaching is Jehovah. But they deny that Jesus is the one true God, but only a God, a created being that has attained the status of a God. In the New World Translation of John's Gospel, which is what the JWs use, it's their own translation, there were no Greek or Hebrew scholars involved whatsoever in the translating of it, so I really don't know how they did it. Well, I do know how they did it. They just took the King James Version and then changed it to suit their own doctrines. Because in the beginning, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. And by putting that one letter in, they changed the whole meaning of the text. But that's what they believe. Now, if you think that's weird, the Mormons believe that Jesus was the product 
of a physical relationship between Elohim and another goddess. Ron Rhodes, you may have heard of, he writes a lot of books on prophecy and about cults and so on. He's got an excellent book. It's, a, it's a, really a reference book if you want to find out about cults or new religions and thinkings. It's called The Handbook on Cults and New Religions. <laughs> it's that simple. But by Ron Rhodes, excellent book. And he describes the teachings of the Mormons like this concerning Jesus. Jesus was allegedly begotten as the first spirit child of the father, Elohim, and one of his unnamed wives, the heavenly mother. Jesus is the first and highest of all the spirit children. After all, Jesus is called the firstborn. Because the heavenly father and mother had many other spirit children who have now been born as humans, Jesus is often referred to by Mormons as our elder brother. And then he puts in brackets after it, by the way, Lucifer is also the spirit brother of Jesus, according to Mormon teaching. Mormons call Jesus our elder brother because they believe that among the Mormons there are some of these spirit children created by this physical union between Elohim and the Heavenly Mother. You talk about weird and wacky. We need to be very careful how we refer to the Lord. He calls us brethren and he has every right to do that because of who he is. He has that authority. But we, can we really call him our brother? He's our Lord. He's our Savior. He's our Master. Can we really call him our brother? Are we really on equal footing with Jesus? And yet there's one verse of that song, and it's a, it's a beautiful song, except for this one verse. As the deer pants for the water. What does the second verse say? You're my friend and you are my brother. Even though you are a king. Now if we were to sing you're my friend and you call me brother. That's different. That's the Lord's right. But he's our Lord. And we should never reduce the relationship that we have with God in that way. He's far more than that. Now we've already looked at the name El, the name of power, okay? So I'm not going to dwell on it tonight, which is the name that's used here. But just to emphasize and, and point out here that the full name that we see here for the mighty God is a double emphasis on the power and might of God. The name El itself means the God of power. It, it, it has that force behind it, that has that meaning behind it. The full name here is El Gibor, which means powerful God of might. So it's emphasizing the might and the power of God. And that's wonderful because when the world is in total chaos, we can rest knowing that it's in the hands of the mighty God. When burdens are threatening to bend us and to break us, we can turn to the mighty God for strength. When it seems that everyone's against us and it seems that every law that's written and every judgment that's handed down seems to go against what is holy and right and true, we know that the mighty God is going to have his way in the end. The Lord Jesus Christ is not as he is portrayed in many works of art. He's not some weak-limbed, effeminate figurehead. He's the mighty God come in flesh I cringe whenever I see some of these portrayals of Jesus and he's portrayed as almost effeminate I think it's, I think it's blasphemy to portray him like that he's the mighty God and praise God that he is but then we see the next one, it's the everlasting father. Now this is the one that confuses many people and I can understand why. I, I have struggled with this a lot as well to, until I got studying it and got a bit of better understanding of it. How can the son be called the heavenly father? I'm not going to ask how many people have ever thought that whenever you're reading it. <laughs> but it, does it not seem a bit out of place when it's talking about the Lord Jesus, the heavenly father? The clue to this 
is how these names are introduced. Again, the beginning of verse 6, it says, Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. This isn't looking at Jesus from God's perspective. This is looking at Jesus from our perspective as we worship him. It's not talking about the the Lord's relationship with the Trinity. It's talking about his relationship with us. And to us, in many ways, he acts as a father. As the everlasting father, he's the source of our eternal life. Of course, fathers contribute to bringing life into the world. In 1 Corinthians 4.15, For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. The life didn't come from Paul. Paul was the influence. Paul was what was used by God. But it was in Christ that they got their new life. In 1 John 5 and 11, this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. And so the life that we have comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Eternal life is found in the Son. So the Son is the source of our eternal life. And when we, excuse me, when we receive him as Savior, he imparts his own eternal life to us. Which makes us new creations in Christ. You know, that, that eternal life that we get, we sort of take it off to the side and almost detach it from God himself. That, that it's, a, it's almost like a separate gift that God gives. So he has all this uh, eternal life just sitting ready, waiting to be passed on to the people who trust in the Lord Jesus. But it's not that at all. It's his own life. He's bringing us back really to what we should be. Because what did God do to Adam? He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Adam is the only person in history who had eternal life and lost it. God made him perfect. He had God's life within him. But when God gave him that one test and he failed it in the garden, he died. Now, it's... it's, I don't know where Adam is tonight. I would like to think that Adam obeyed God from that moment and they offered the sacrifices. He did teach Seth and he did teach Abel and he taught Cain as well because God said that Cain had no excuse. So he did teach his children how they were to approach God. Maybe Adam's with God or not, I don't know. But the important thing is that once we get eternal life from Christ, we can never lose it. Because we've got it from Christ himself. And he's given it to us on the, on the basis of what he did on the cross. So we possess eternal life now. Now that means that there's two lives within us battling for control. We've got our natural carnal life. And we've got our supernatural spiritual life. The eternal life God has given us. And as you know the more we depend on the Lord. The more the eternal. The more the spiritual life is going to overcome the natural and the carnal life. So as the everlasting father, he's the source of our eternal life. But as the everlasting father, he's the source of our temporal comfort. He gives us comfort. A father seeks to comfort and soothe his child whenever they're suffering. Now, I know that mothers are better at this than we are. All right? I will give you that. Women are just more compassionate than we are naturally. On average... But in saying that, if somebody comes and messes with our kids, they'd better watch out. Because our job is to look after them. Our job is to care for them. And the father not only feels the need to calm his child, but to put things right. And that continues all through life. I can remember one time going into work. Not to, not to work, but to leave on another sick line. And I bumped into the boss in the administration suite and he asked me when I was coming back and I says I'm just leaving in another sick line for two weeks and he rolled his eyes and tutted and says it'll be cheaper getting you a wheelchair now Heather was driving that day obviously I, I couldn't drive the car at that time so I called into my parents house and my dad of course heard what happened 
And he basically had to be talked down <laughs> from going to the school and uh, given a piece of his mind to my boss. Now, that would have been a bit embarrassing for somebody <laughs> in their 20s at that time. But uh, fathers look after their kids. And does the Lord not look after us? We're of immense value to the Lord. How do we know that? Well, he experienced the shame and the agony of the cross so that we could be saved. He's not going to forget that. Uh, so when it comes to looking after the ones who are saved by that sacrifice, he's going to give us everything that we need. He already gave himself. There's nothing else he isn't willing to give. Concerning the Father... It says, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If, if he gave us the son, then he'll give us everything else, because the son was the absolute best. And nothing compares to that. And although it's speaking of the father, remember the Lord was fully subject to the father's will, and he voluntarily went to the cross. He is co-equal in all things with the father and the spirit. So when God the father will not hold anything back from us that we need, neither will God the son, neither will God the Holy Spirit. They're not going to withhold any good thing from us. The Lord God is a son and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So as everlasting father, he's the source of our eternal life. He's the source of our temporal comfort. And he's the source of our absolute security. He's everlasting. He's eternal. We could write this name as father of eternity. And remember Paul said in Colossians 3 and 3, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. If our lives are hid with Christ in God, and the Lord Jesus is everlasting, if he's eternal, then our lives are secured for all eternity because Christ is eternal. Our lives are hid in Christ. If Christ were ever somehow to cease to exist, then we would cease to exist. But he's eternal. <clears throat> and so we're secure for eternity. And it's hard for us to fully appreciate the importance of that here and now, but if we could even grasp just, just a part of the significance of that, it would chase away so many worries and fears. We can get so worked up over things in this life but by definition, they're temporary. They're not going to last. Any emotional response that we have to any kind of situation, it's passing. It's going to be gone so quickly. And in the end, we can get worked up about what other people think about us and so on. But in the end, the only opinion that matters is the eternal opinion of God. Think about it. The opinions of every person Every person's opinion is going to change someday. Why? Because none of us have perfect knowledge. None of us have perfect wisdom. We can't see into the future. We don't know the end from the beginning. And whenever we get to heaven, I was going to say many of our opinions, probably all of our opinions are going to change when we get there. Because we're going to see things from a completely different perspective. But God's opinion is never going to change. He sees the end from the beginning. He has all wisdom. He has all knowledge. And his opinion of us stands for eternity. Therefore, only his opinion should matter. And that's what we should focus our efforts on. So in that sense, the, the Lord Jesus is the everlasting Father, the source of our eternal life, the source of of our temporal comfort and the source of our absolute security. Finally, the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. The Prince is a chief, a ruler, or a captain. He's the one with the immediate and ultimate authority over a matter. And in this case, it's the issue of peace. Now, what does Christ have the authority to give us peace concerning? Well, first, there's our standing with God. <clears throat> Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. Is that not the greatest peace that we could have? To know that we have peace with God. To know that God's willing to accept us. He's willing to take us and to, whenever we come to his throne of grace, when we ask him for anything, we can come boldly because we have peace with God. We don't need to fear God striking us down and casting us into hell because he has saved us. And because of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have peace. Now, we don't come cocky before God. We don't come arrogantly before God. God doesn't give anything to people that are proud. He resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And when we come before him with that humble attitude, knowing that it's because of Christ that we have peace with God, that gives us the confidence to come before God and expect our prayers to be answered because of the peace we have with God. So he's the authority to give us peace concerning our standing with God. But he has the authority to give us peace concerning our cleansing from sin. Not just at the point of our salvation, but all through life as we sin day by day. And we must come before God and we seek his cleansing. And he does cleanse us. He then gives us peace concerning that. We're told in 1 John 2, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now why is that such a big deal? Well, the next verse says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He's the one that satisfied God. And because he satisfied God, whenever he acts as our advocate, before God and pleads on our behalf it's somebody who has already satisfied God in every possible way coming before God and making requests on our behalf imagine that Jesus making requests on our behalf praying to God the Father for us is that not wonderful that should give us the sense of what it must have been like for the disciples whenever they heard the Lord praying for them especially Peter when he said to Peter that Satan hath desired to have you to sift you as wheat all of the disciples that is he was trying to sift out all the disciples to separate them out and divide them then he said to Peter but I have prayed for thee him particularly I have prayed for thee how wonderful must that have been for Jesus himself to say to somebody, I've prayed for you. Well, folks, that's what, God, that's what he's doing for us every single day. Is that not wonderful? Is that not encouragement for our hearts? Peter then, appropriately, said, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Folks, whenever we come to the Lord and we confess that we have sinned against him day by day, he will save us, he will restore us, he will accept us back again, just as a father accepts a repentant child. You know, whenever a child does something wrong and they come back in tears saying that they're sorry, what, what do you do? You take them up on your knee and you put your arms around them and give them a big hug. Why would God treat us any differently? In fact, he treats us even more graciously. What a wonderful God. But Christ has the authority to give us peace concerning our living among sinners. Now, I don't mean that there are sinners there and we are not. That's not what I mean. I mean as sinners among sinners. <clears throat> there's an aspect of this where there's a responsibility upon us. Paul says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, you live peaceably with all men. And over and over again, we're, we're told to keep peace, keep unity. He said to the Ephesians, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So there's a responsibility upon us to maintain peace. But there's also the blessing of peace that's given through reconciliation. In Colossians 1 and 20, Paul said, having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. 
Things in earth, that's us. Things in heaven, that's the believers that have gone before. We are one in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is peace between us. Just to see this emphasized, turn over into Ephesians 2, please. Ephesians 2. And verse 11. Ephesians 2 and verse 11. <clears throat> Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. It's painting a lovely picture, isn't it? <laughs> That's what we were. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Very often we read that verse and we think that's talking about the partition between us and God. It's not. Look at the context. It's talking about the partition between Jews and Gentiles. And they were divided. And you remember in Acts chapter 15, I think it is, uh, where there was a debate amongst the Jewish believers about whether the Gentiles had to be circumcised, whether they had to follow the law of Moses. Uh, and, and as part of this debate, Peter weighed in on it and he described how God had accepted the Gentiles without any of those things. And the Holy Spirit came and fell upon the house of Cornelius and his family, his whole household got saved. The Holy Spirit came upon them without having to do any of those things. And Peter says, how can we, expect, how can we challenge God? How can we not accept what God has accepted? And so it's showing, it's emphasizing that this partition that man had constructed between Jews and Gentiles was now broken down in the Lord Jesus Christ and made us one. Having abolished, verse 15, in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. This is exactly what it's talking about here. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. You see the, the emphasis on peace, 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 peace between Jews and Gentiles, peace within the body of Christ. And it's that uh, peace that we're to maintain and to defend as we seek to live with one another as, a, as sinners among sinners. Although many of us saved by grace, praise God. Final thing, Christ has the authority to give us peace concerning our thinking and feeling. Our thinking and feeling. So many Christians lack peace because of what they think and what they feel. Imagination. Ideas. Opinions. Concerned about what people are saying about them and so on and so forth. But listen to Paul again in these lovely verses in Philippians 4, 6 to 9. Be careful for nothing. Anybody who's a worrier, that means don't worry about anything. Nothing. All right? Not one thing. <laughs> Easier said than done, isn't it? But in everything, this is how we be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. You'll find that it's very difficult to worry when you're thanking God. And the immediate thing that you can do whenever you start to worry is find the thing to thank God for and keep thanking him and thanking him over and over again, even if it's for the same thing, until the worry goes away. Because you can't worry if you're thanking God. And the peace of God, here's the proof of it, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God enters and guards our hearts and minds. It guards our feelings. It guards our thoughts. 
through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when we thank God, we discover that everything that we're thanking him for are only ours because of Christ. So our mind gets put on to Christ again. And that takes away the worry. He then goes on. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. By the way, there's nine things mentioned there, and I would love to do a wee comparison with the fruit of the Spirit on that one again. <laughs> but I'll let you do that at home. All right. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So when we get our minds off the worry and onto thanking, then we will get our minds onto Christ. As we get our minds onto Christ, we get our minds onto his character, onto his nature. We'll think about these things that are true, honest, just, pure, and so on. As we do that, the God of peace will be with us we will become aware of his presence with us we're looking at his attributes we're thinking about his attributes as those thoughts penetrate our hearts and penetrate our soul and our spirit then we realize that what we're really doing is just thinking about God that's worship that's worship and when you have worship in your heart you'll not have worry in your heart and so as we approach this Christmas season, as we hear these verses read over and over again in Isaiah 9, in verses 6 and 7, we hear these names, Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. They're there to comfort our hearts and cause us to bring praise and glory to God. And I trust that we will do over this Christmas season. Now before we go to prayer.